So I think that kind of stuff is just emerging now because now is when we've got people who have had a regular diet of hardcore porn from age like seven, 10, who are reaching their early adulthood. So the studies are still coming, but I believe it's going to have permanent damage on how they view themselves in relationships. And, and could it be overcome? Yes, but it's going to take a lot of like trying to unlearn the lies that pornography tells you. The following program contains subject matter that some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion advised. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Change Agents, an ironclad original. I hope that you're ready to have an uncomfortable conversation today. Not that listening or watching this episode would necessarily be uncomfortable, even though we're going to cover a topic that can push people outside of their comfort zone. But my hope for today is that after listening to this, you find people in your life that may be susceptible to the issue that we're talking about and you talk with them. What, what am I getting at here? I'm talking about porn. I am talking about the sexual trafficking and human trafficking associated with the porn industry, specifically online hosting of images and videos around that ecosystem. I'm talking about exposure to hardcore pornography for young men and women through these amazing devices that we carry in our pockets every day that have unfettered access to information, which should terrify you if you are a parent, especially if you have not implemented every control possible to protect your children from this type of information. We're gonna talk about the addictive nature of pornography the changes in the brain, the studies associated with exposure to porn at a young age and how it can have impact on behavior later in life. All of this through the lens of my guest today, Dawn Hawkins. She is the CEO for the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, NCOSE. It is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that is dedicated to exposing the links between all forms of sexual abuse and exploitation. Let's get into this. Strap yourself in. Explain for me, if you will, what the National Center on Sexual Exploitation does. Mm -hmm. So we're focused on mass scale prevention of sexual abuse and exploitation. We're trying to challenge institutional behaviors that allow exploitation to grow and um, and also change cultural norms that do that. So um, pornography is one of those, we think, root factors that has really just normalized the sexual commodification of everyone and abuse and exploitation in general. And so we really work to strike at the porn industry and changing and curbing that behavior. And we um, are really focused on doing so by with corporate advocacy. We engage directly with corporations and we also are working on policy at the state, federal, and that and international level. And because that work has been a little bit slow, we started a law center so we could sue them and move things along faster. And that's working really well. So, you're talking about suing the actual porn industry itself? Yes, we have a whole bunch. There are now a number of lawsuits against the big pornography companies, the national. Center on Sexual Exploitation Law Center has lawsuits against the biggest three, um, and we're doing really well in the court so far. The what? problem, Andy, is that these websites are hosting a ton of image-based sexual abuse. In many cases, our plaintiffs were, some of them were children. They were, were horrifically abused. They were sex trafficked, and it was filmed and uploaded to these pornography websites. Others of our clients were, one of our group of our clients was a, a college sports team, field hockey team that just went to do a, to do an away game and some creepy janitor hid 
cameras in the locker room, filmed the sport, the field hockey team and, and uploaded it to Pornhub and X videos and X hamster. And these women have just had so much trauma. They cannot get it down. Um, we've also got a number of um, survivors. We have survivors who were victims of sexual assault. It was filmed and it was recorded and uploaded to these websites. I mean, people like to think that the content on these websites is all consensual and over age when it's very far from that. These websites don't check the age at all of those who are depicted and they definitely don't check consent. Yeah. What do you think the odds are that the, I don't even I know what the correct term would be, the owners or the managers of those websites don't know what is on their platform? Oh, they a hundred percent no. We That's, have so that was much. my guess. <laughs> <laughs> they know, and in many cases, we've got cases where like there's criminal charges moving uh, against some of the traffickers who have uploaded the content, and yet Pornhub will still keep the content up, even though the victims are begging them to take it down so they know and they're they're profiting from it they're running tons of ads they'll even a lot of the times what we're finding too is some of the um definitely known images of sexual abuse that are non-consensual they'll take the titles of that and they'll name other things similar titles because it's getting set the algorithms going so well they want to keep it going so even if sometimes they take down the images or the videos they are using the, the victims names and like the same types of titles to keep it going it's great they know they know that's disturbing on a variety of fronts one that that abuse is happening obviously two that it's being uploaded but three that enough people are searching for that type of stuff that their algorithm is recognizing that and then targeting that type of behavior there's not a single aspect of that that sounds healthy in any way shape or form they're criminal. The criminals through and through. Where are these organizations based out of? How can they how can they escape not taking those things down? The reality is like our government, our policy just doesn't force them to. So there is a law, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which essentially immunizes websites from being held responsible for even illegal content that's being uploaded to them. And so because of that, like our government, law enforcement, they're just not going after them yet. That's why we're fighting to both change that law, but also to hold them accountable through civil litigation in order to move criminal charges against them as well. Um, we believe legislation is radically needed. That there, there shouldn't, we're in today's world, you shouldn't be able to upload a sexually explicit image of anyone without their consent. Yeah. That should no longer happen. And there is no, there's no laws about that. There are laws on the books, none at the federal level, but 48 states have laws that if you like received a nude image of somebody you can't distribute it further without their permission but it's only about you as the like individual and the penalties are not very harsh for you but as a website that's collecting and distributing there's nothing against them so state there, or federal level. so there's no teeth that could chew into them and start changing the way that they conduct themselves well we believe some of the teeth are that this actually is sex trafficking that by Selling, use uploading, selling, facilitating the continual um, distribution of these images that they're actually sex trafficking these victims. And that's what we're arguing in court and largely what we're winning on so far. What's their response in court? What's their argument for what they're doing? Um, it's not their responsibility. They're not responsible for what other people upload that it's actually, they didn't know. So it shouldn't be their, like, you know, it's not their burden. Um, and huh. that we're just lying that the victims are lying. Yeah. There's nothing like turning it right back around on the victim. I think they call that uh gaslighting. I'm not sure, but I think that's pretty close to the they, term. <laughs> they gaslight a lot. Yeah. I think, and if I, you know, we said, you said you want to talk about the porn industry and really we got into the realities happening in the porn industry directly, you know, and, and the performers, those who are depicted, but the, the harms facing those who are exposed to the content is equally just as devastating too. So I, I don't want to like forget that side also. 
Yeah, no, I definitely wanted to talk about that. And again, I'm slightly self-serving because I have children at a at an age um, in a generation where at least my kids almost uh, actually just turned 15 for my daughter, uh, turning 18 in two days for my son, and then 20 for my uh, oldest later this year. But they will probably be the last generation. They didn't have cell phones until their teenage years. Um, Not anywhere. Yeah, it's, you know, they, they're, it's, you know, the internet was still, I mean, it's not that it was, you know, in its infancy by any stretch, but I think their exposure to it was a little bit more delayed than any other generation um, that's going to be coming up because it's just right there front and center. I mean, I have a refrigerator that's connected to the internet at this point. It's ridiculous. Like <laughs> why I have that, I don't know. And for anybody out there thinking about getting one, just skip it. It's, I don't know why you need the internet connected to your fridge, but I bet you. Somebody could figure out a way to play porn on that thing. And that's that's my concern with my kids. Um, I have tried and I've done my best as a parent to protect them, educate them, have open and honest conversations. But I also realize at the age for my kids, their social circle has an equal amount of influence, if not a greater influence than I do. And they're spending a lot of time with their social circle. And one of the things I try to warn my friends about who have kids and they're very restrictive with their devices is that it's not just what they do with their device. It's what their friends are doing with their devices and whether or not your children are have access to it. Um, it's amazing the things that they can find their way around and what it leads them to. And oftentimes it's self sexually explicit images or topics. And I really worry about the impact of that at such a young age. It, it's going to be devastating. I, I have so much to say about this. I, one thought that comes to mind initially is right now, you know, that like the homepage of these porn sites is, is it's, it's extremely violent. It's racist. It's incest themed. It's horrible. The content is showing up on the homepages of these websites. But what's showing up on the homepages is what um, users of porn are at now after like 40 years of, developing their addiction yeah. and the problem is that our children are entering their exposure to pornography at that level already they're not seeing like just topless images of women and then they're growing along with their like you know they're entering this at the really hardcore violent i don't i don't want to it's so depressing. So why, where are we going to go and where, how is that going to impact? Because we know it has devastating impacts on the brain. It desensitizes the users. Um, they want to seek out harder material, different kinds of genres. You know, your brain doesn't continue. You want dopamine hits, which pornography will offer you. And, um, and so there's, there's all of that to consider. There's also this point that, yeah, these issues have become kind of the wallpaper of our young people's lives. Largely, I would argue, because the technology platforms have not prioritized their safety. They're allowing content like this. I hate calling it adult content, but content that's supposedly for adults to be so easily accessible and the kind of predatory targeting so easily accessible to our kids. So one of the things we're doing at Nicosi is really trying to change the tech industry to prioritize their safety who they're exposed to and what they're exposed to, to decrease that the harm that's definitely coming. How has the response been from the tech industry when you work with them on this? Oh, it's been like a cat and dog fight for 10 years, but <laughs> finally we're winning. I mean, today, Instagram rolled out a number of changes where adults can no longer send direct messages to kids. That was the main way Adults were sending pornography and grooming, like they were yeah. predatory adults reaching out to kids. That's how every survivor of trafficking I've met in the last two years under age 20 started on Instagram because of that grooming through there. And it went over to Snapchat and TikTok and elsewhere. But um, so how's it going? Well, finally, we're seeing massive changes. Uh, just like six weeks ago, two, two months ago, Google announced that they're going to blur all sexually explicit and violent images in Google Images, not just for kids, but for like all users, unless you turn it on. Like, so we're seeing a shift now because we're all like fed up and we're mad. And I think honestly, a lot of us, you know, our age and 
and and younger, we have lived with some of the harm and we're demanding better. So I'm very hopeful. Yeah. Still a little slower. The lawsuits are helping spur it along. But yeah. do you mean literally like today Instagram rolled out that feature? Yeah, today. No kidding. What a I'll, fortuitous I'll timing. To send it to you. Hey everyone. Andy Stumpf here, the host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents podcast. In addition to producing podcasts like Change Agents, Danger Close with Jack Carr, Oil & Whiskey with Roadster Shop, and others, Ironclad also works with some of the world's biggest brands like Mechanics Wear, Under Armour, the Navy SEAL Foundation, Anthem, and a ton of others to create industry-leading custom film series, commercials, podcasts, and more. We can also get your message in front of an audience of millions by placing it on podcasts and series just like this one. To check out more about Ironclad and see how they can help you elevate your company, brand, or business, check out thisisironclad.com. Thisisironclad.com. I can't even imagine being a young person and being exposed to sexuality through those images that you're talking about on the landing pages that are have an essence of violence or incest or any of those things that has to, I mean, sex is a very natural thing. I mean, we all are, you know, you and I are sitting here because of the result of that at some point in time from our parents, it's <laughs> a very natural thing, but I can't even imagine how that would shatter your reality of what normal is when it comes to sex and sexuality, when that is your first exposure. I believe that a huge reason that we have this mental health crisis facing our youth, it seems like unprecedented levels today, is because of the like impact of the these messages on our kids. The hypersexualized world, the way that they think they're expected to interact with each other, with themselves, like it's causing such massive harm to who they who they are and who, how they're developing. Can you talk about, speaking of developing, can you talk a little bit about the negative effects that porn can have on the human brain? I think one of the things that, that's really helpful for people to understand is that largely pornography can follow the same like addictive pathways as lots of other drugs. And and, and behavioral addictions like gambling are, is the same. So it truly can change the pathways. One of the things that um, is helpful to understand is that it, you become habituated to it. You become desensitized and and you get this dopamine hit that you often just, you just want to crave. And the problem is one of the things I love about the research is it talks about what happens when you're in a real sexual relationship with a real person, your brain is just so perfect. It's, it puts out all these hormones that get you excited, ready to engage in that act with them. And afterwards, more homo hormones are released that help you feel really connected, um, trusting them, you're bonded to them. Like, it's so perfect for our relationships, right? Like real human connection, which I think brings the greatest joy. And, but with pornography, what happens is like all those same hormones are released when you're watching pornography, just as when you're getting ready to have sex, but you don't get that satiation, that, that satiated feeling afterwards. Those other hormones, don't come after you watch porn, even after you've masturbated. Instead, you're habituating yourself to pixels on a screen instead of to real people. It becomes much harder to connect really on that intimate level, the trusting level with people in real life. There, there's a number of studies about this. Um, some other studies are showing, you know, while our brains change and we crave harder types of material with pornography over time, they can change back. And that's like the good I see um, in overcoming kind of pornography dependencies is that as you um, are able to pull away from that, your brain changes back and you are able to find connection with people in real life. And so um, that's just like a little bit, but then there's also a lot on the developing brain. It changes sexual template. Um, it changes who you think you're, um, attracted to how you view yourself and your own worth. Um, we're finding that, I mean, not we, studies are showing that there's a drastic increase in sexual assault and abuse, being a victim of sexual assault and abuse for those who watch pornography, particularly for girls. 
why is that? And I just think about the messages that girls are telling themselves. If the porn they're watching, which almost all of it is violent, it shows women being abused in lots of ways. It shows women saying no, but in the porn, when they say no, they really mean yes. So what we have is like more young girls have been groomed to be victims of sexual abuse and violence because they think that's normal. Normal. I think that's how they're, it's supposed to be. Um, and then likewise, we're seeing greater amounts of aggression in men who, in young men who watch pornography and why it's the lessons that they're learning um, to be the aggressor. Um, I just saw a meta uh, study that just came out last week or it crossed my desk last week, at least. We've been talking about this for years, but there's significant increase in child on child harmful sexual behavior so children acting out on other children the doj shows that arrest records of like, abusers of children 33 percent are of children it's so crazy wow. why is that all of a sudden and what the research is showing and lots of anecdotal evidence is that because children are being exposed to pornography at young ages they're simply seeking to act out what they're viewing and they don't know that it's bad. They think this is what adults do. They think what it's what you're supposed to do with each other. Yeah. So they're acting out on each other and it's causing immense harm. It's not that suddenly we have a lot of predatory monster children who just want to hurt others. They're just mimicking what they're viewing in this context. So it's hopeful to hear you say that, you know, as an adult, somebody who may be finds themselves having an addiction to porn, that it can be re reversed, right? That they can they can work their way out of that and their hormones yes. can mm -hmm. reset themselves. Is that also true at the developmental age or is that more permanent? It's hard to know. The, the, the research really in that age is just difficult. I mean, it's really hard to do research in that age. And so I think that kind of stuff is just emerging now because now is when we've got people who have had a regular diet of hardcore porn from age like seven, 10, who are reaching their early adulthood. So the studies are still coming, but I believe it's going to have permanent damage on how they view themselves in relationships. And, and could it be overcome? Yes, but it's going to take a lot of like trying to unlearn the lies that pornography tells you. Yeah. I'm not an expert in anything. Um, and certainly not development, but I have heard enough intelligent people talking about how, you know, the prefrontal cortex, especially in young men, doesn't solidify until 25. I could see you being able to write the course correct the ship later in life. I, if I had to put money on whether or not the early exposure before that development was complete was correctable, I think they're going to... It's gonna, hard to know. I, well, I think the odds are probably going to be against being able to correct for it. You're being... I can't... I was shocked that you just said, you know, hardcore porn exposure between the ages of seven and 10. I cannot even fathom the human the average. Are you serious? Yeah. Th there's no way their brains can understand that without it just mm -hmm. scrambling some eggs. And unless our technology companies and platforms step up and help, especially help parents have power to protect their kids from this, the age is just going to get younger. You know, just an example. Okay, here's some victories that hopefully bring some hope. But Apple has and and Google both have built-in controls that was like they're kind of complicated to turn on, but when you turn them on, they're pretty good. The parental control. You could t block explicit websites and they work very pretty well. Why do they leave it on us to have to turn them on? With Apple, it takes 31 steps to turn on all of their parental controls. And really? it's not in one place. It's like in four different places in the settings. So now one of the victories we had earlier this year was finally got Apple to, by default, it's not enough, but by default, if your iPhone, a parent's iPhone, is synced to a child's iPhone or iPad through family sharing, then automatically all those will be turned on. So that's a big win. We still think, why not just turn them on automatically for all kids? Not not only those who are paired with within adults, like just turn them on for all kids because you know who the kids are. Aren't you? But another victory is Google. So Chromebooks with, with COVID, Google was just pumping out the Chromebooks yep. so that everybody could learn, right? And they were totally unprotected and they left the burden on these parents and teachers who like were drowning right and it's, it wasn't easy <laughs> so we kept going to google and we got a 
bunch of parents, school te- and teachers to join us and just keep hammering them, demanding change and sharing terrible stories with them. And finally, with a software update, Google, with just a software update, all, all Chromebooks using K through 12 schools now automatically have the filters turned on. Like they could do that that simply, both Apple and Google with a software update. So, and it's why like, why, are they why not, not just make that the baseline template for all of your products out of the box? Like, I don't have an issue with consenting adults want to living, wanting to live their life the way that they want to. But how about every product that comes from those organizations have all of the filters on? So then as an adult, you could go back in and turn them off if you wanted to. Like to me, yes, it just seems yes. like it would be simple. Yes, it's so simple. So that's what we're fighting for. You know, we've been begging these companies and they made these like small steps. Now we're trying to pass legislation that would force that. It's passed in a couple of states and we're hoping also a federal version will pass. How addictive has the research shown that pornography is? There's over 400 studies since 2013 that we've got gathered that that show in the exact same kind of addictive behavior of pornography and the way that impacts the brain as drugs. So there's 400 studies saying the same thing. There's like one or two maybe that say, we don't know if it's addictive. It's like, for sure addictive. We we can definitely count on that. Are you looking for a change agent in the energy space? Look no further. Ketone IQ is a category leader. Fuel does not need to be filled with caffeine and sugar. HVMN is changing the narrative. No sugar, no caffeine, no BS. It's just calm, clean energy on demand that improves performance and cognition. HVMN was awarded a $6 million phase two STTR by the U.S. Special Operations Command to produce a ketone-based product that would improve performance at altitude and protect against cognitive loss in hypoxic environments. I'll be honest with you, the flavor is rough, but what's real is the energy, the sustained energy that you will get when you take Ketone IQ. Actually, probably my favorite thing about it though, beyond the energy that you get from it, or in addition to the energy that you get from it, is its size. I mean, you can stuff a couple of these in your backpack. It's not bulky. It's not a full-size drink. Throw it in your bag. Take one when you need it, and you're off and running with clean, sustained energy. Please go check out our partner, HVMN, the brand behind Ketone IQ, at hvmn.com slash change agents. Hit you with that one more time. Let's do it military phonetically. Hotel Victor Mike November.com slash change agents. Still got it. It's no big deal. To receive 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. In your experience, and maybe this question would require a little bit of an anecdotal uh, response just from what you've seen. I'm trying to think of this in terms of other of, of products, you know, or things that are available like alcohol. People would Mm -hmm. argue that you can responsibly use alcohol. Have you ever heard the same argument when it comes to pornography? There's a minimum safe dosage of pornography that won't have an impact on you. I don't usually cuss, but this is one that always makes me (laughs) cuss. (laughs) Let it rip. This is the internet. We can do what we want. I I know. Um, no, there's no amount of safe pornography and there's nothing, it doesn't exist. This like idea. There's also this argument that like there's feminist pornography and that is like safe and good. And no, I could tell you so much about it. But the problem is that those who are depicted in pornography are usually almost always like they're impacted. They face lifelong trauma for being in that. Even if like in the moment they, they uh, agreed to be in it, like usually years later it's caused trauma and it's caught, had adverse impacts but then what about the impact on the user it doesn't happen in a vacuum again it's impacting your attitudes your beliefs your sexual templates and that then it also impacts the community around you so if you're someone watching pornography it's also impacting how you interact with your husband or your wife with your kids with your neighbors with the waitress at the restaurant with you know Everyone you interact with, it colors the way you see the world. And so that's part of a problem, too, is we've got now, like, like, you know, teachers and pastors and doctors and judges and 
police officers all who have been watching this very violent, hardcore content now for a long time. And it has completely impacted how they see the world. So as a, <clears throat> one thing I keep saying is, you know, we, we talk a lot as a society about ending sexual violence against women. We are never, we're never going to end violence, sexual violence against women if we don't address pornography. I mean, from the earliest ages, we're saying it's okay to rape and violently, you know, hit and do, I don't want to get into all the graphic things, do terrible things to women. And until we address that and the impact it's having on your brain and the way you see the world, we're not going to end violence against women. No amount of teaching consent is going to change that. I think consent is critical. We have to address it. But one of the root problems of our violence against women epidemic is porn. What are the studies showing when it comes to links between porn consumption and other psychological issues? Is there an overlay there? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I can't talk that much about it because I'm just like, I just can't remember. I haven't talked about that in a few years. But we've got a few studies on our website at insexualexploitation.org slash pornography that really gets into um, a number of other mental health issues that are connected or correlated to pornography use. Yeah depression, like isolation. Um, and, and often too, a lot of times our mental health struggles drive us to compulsively use pornography. Sometimes that is the root reason. One of the things I, as a, as a parent, I think, and also, you know, a solution I think to these problems is if we as, as people could feel comfortable being uncomfortable, we would not have this epidemic we've got with, with porn addiction and all kinds of phone addictions, but really it's because we're feeling lonely, sad, bored, angry, those kinds of feelings like make us feel uncomfortable and we turn to our phones to connect. And if we were instead connecting with other humans, like we would be so much healthier, but many turn to porn to connect for that, you know, to deal with those kinds of feelings. Yeah, we have unfettered access to information and people, but I, you look at people who would rather sit... And this is one that uh, I'm guilty of this, as I'm sure everybody is, but you'll see a family sitting at a dinner table at a restaurant, and instead of engaging and interacting with each other, their head's down. Every one of them is, you know, has that portal yeah. to untapped and unfettered information. So at the surface, you could say, oh, we're more connected than, we, than we've ever been. But a few feet underneath the wave tops, it's people that are more disconnected to include with yeah. the, the closest members of their families, where you could be having those deep, rich conversations developing those bonds absent of something that you were going to expose yourself to on a digital medium. Exactly. I mean, even I struggle with that myself. We have to be so intentional, at, you know, to really be present in the offline world and connect with others. And so it's easy for us to understand and have empathy for those struggling, but it's a real challenge that we're all facing. But what one thing that parents don't understand is that the algorithm that our kids are getting is so different from what we get. So while really? we might not be seeing sexually explicit content that much on these platforms, our kids are seeing a ton. Their experiences on there are very different. Just like oh, Senator Blumenthal, oh my gosh, you've got to see this. There was a hearing uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he like set up a fake account. <laughs> and he, as like a teenage girl, and he tested it out himself. And like the the content coming at him was all about like <laughs> body image stuff. Like bulimia, anorexia, like it's fine and normal. Just come in because he was simply a 13 year old girl. Like he immediately, he just had started the account and already that content was coming at him. Hypersexualized stuff. Like the, the algorithms are very different that our kids get than what we do. And so that's why we might not think it's as dangerous. The tech companies know. Oh, and they should be creating safer algorithms for the kids, but they don't. They don't have their safety in mind at all. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, an adult, not that I don't, yeah. I don't think anybody, honestly, should be having a few feed full of sexually explicit material. If I had to, though, gun to my head and I, and I had to choose between somebody who was underage and still developing, receiving that information, or somebody who was past that developmental phase of their brain and older and hopefully with the filters and life experience to be able to deal with it, of course I'm going to choose the adult to receive that information, not the children. How can a tech company reasonably justify or articulate a need for that in any way, shape, or form? It's so much worse. We have a number of fake accounts on, on these platforms to do our research. 
Oh, we haven't talked about. We have the Dirty Dozen list. People love it. What? We name twelve companies. How could you leave this year. out? Yeah, immediately I tell know. me all twelve names. <laughs> <laughs> well, in doing research for them, we have like these fake accounts, and we, like I'm telling you, our fake accounts are like a fourteen year old boy, we're a fifteen year old girl. The content is so hypersexualized immediately. But for me, as a 38 year old woman, I go on and I'm getting like funny dance videos and recipes and exercise, you know, home decor. It's wow. such different algorithms. Tell me more about this dirty dozen. I'm, all, I'm not letting this slip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're on our 10th year of naming 12 companies where, who are facilitating and profiting from sexual abuse and exploitation. Um, We've had some massive successes, so a couple of victories over the years. We got like almost all hotels to get rid of pornography from their rooms, it's like old fashioned now, but pretty big deal back then. Um, we got Netflix to to institute parental controls. And because Netflix got parental controls, now like all the other streaming services mostly have them too. Um, we got, we've had just massive, the victory I told you about earlier with Chromebooks and with Apple are because of our dirty dozen list. Um, but some of our targets this year, um, we've got Roblox. People have no idea. Roblox is a game that's massively, it's a gaming platform, massively popular for kids. It was initially made for kids under age, under age 13. There's 12.8 million users every day under age eight on this platform but it's like a predator's paradise and roblox knows there's over like you could just google this i i helped to do some of the background research this year on this campaign and found like a thousand cases i found a thousand cases of adults targeting kids on the roblox platform a thousand cases in one year no over since they started in 2017 okay i was gonna say that's an um, average of three a day that's terrifying which yeah. I, to be honest i, mean, I wouldn't I, be I'm shocked not if the numbers way if higher that's, i bet it's higher than that this is just like news articles and arrest records i could find myself with just google searches you yeah. know in, in in like a couple hours but um we have so one of the problems is that roblox has this game that they built for kids but they haven't kept kids safety in mind at all they allow adults to chat with kids automatically if you're in the gaming platform like you were saying the xbox example of your friends so so tragic that is the kind of thing that's happening constantly but parents are like pressured into letting me, my nine-year-old is non-stop begging me to play roblox yeah. like what everyone's playing all of his social so circle is playing it yeah i got the same <laughs> pressure with my kids growing up that's why they wanted to have electronic devices they were the outlier in their social groups and to the argument from them not very well articulated at their preteen age was I, you know, I have to have this device to fit in with my friends. Yeah. It's where yeah. my, yeah, it's where my friends are, you know, living, it's where they're communicating. And so I'll be ostracized from the social circle if I don't have the same ability. And it's, it's a slow pathway to hell. Who else is on the dirty dozen? Cause I had actually heard of Roblox. Well, one that people are really surprised about is app. We have the Apple app store. The problem is Apple has like the worst age ratings they don't enforce age ratings at all of apps but basically all of their like parental controls are based on the ratings of apps so if you try to turn on their built-in controls and you say like my kid is five or four they've got apps in there that are rated four plus that have sexually explicit content in it that allow strangers to contact kids that have back doors to the in open internet that's unfiltered if you go through the app. That shouldn't be rated age four. Yeah. Pornhub has a has a VPN, right? To try to mask where you're coming from in order to watch stuff. It's rated four plus. Are you serious? Yeah, that's what it is. Um <sighs> we had a big victory kick. Kick is also on our dirty dozen list. It's a really popular social media platform for kids. It's massively popular globally. It's a little bit less popular in the United States. Um, but it's like the number one app for sexually explicit, like grooming, tra child trafficking, CSAM, et cetera, all over Kit. Um, finally, we have them on the Dirty Dozen list, and we, we got them a couple weeks ago to increase their age. They were rated for nine plus, and now they're 17 plus. So... I mean, we, we get incremental changes, and that's why I love this campaign so much. It really puts the pressure on these companies. But the, but the problem is it shouldn't 
take that much effort. Like they just need to do the right thing. And so mm -hmm. that's why we're we're suing them now. Uh, MasterCard, part of the porn victories recently. So we've got these these lawsuits against them. Um, we we got MasterCard, Visa, Discover, and PayPal to stop processing payments for Pornhub. And now if you want to go on Pornhub, you can only use cryptocurrency. It like drastically hurt them. They removed in 24 hours, 13 million videos. Really? In 24 hours because Visa and MasterCard told them they had to um, because of our pressure, because of the dirty dozen list and, and pressure. We got a really important news article in the New York Times. But the point is like this kind of pressure on corporate America changes. It changes culture. It changes these other big companies who are built on abuse. And, and we have to, we, we just find it massively successful. But Visa has been named in one of the lawsuits against Pornhub as a defendant. The, we're not co-counsel on that case, but the case is arguing that they profited from the sex trafficking of children also because they get a percentage, right? Yeah. And I think that's true and it's the right thing to do. I mean, it is true. I mean, credit cards for people who don't realize it, I'm assuming most people do, they take a scrape of transactions. That's how they make their money. That's why they have cards. So yeah, if people were in fact using that on Pornhub or other sites, they would get a, a, a micro percentage of those sales. So they absolutely did. Uh, profit from it. Yeah, they profited from it for sure. And they knew because actually the victims that they who were named in the lawsuit, like our organization brought evidence to Visa a year before and we met with them. We kept sending them evidence. They knew. Yeah. OK, so what advice do you have for parents that know that this ecosystem is out there? They have kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can speak for myself. I'm sure I could probably speak for you as a parent, like your worst fear is something bad happening to your child. What advice do you have for parents in the digital world where this stuff is a click away? Well, first I'd say put up whatever kind of barriers you think you can. Try to protect them as long as you can. <laughs> Use the tools, turn on the parental controls, get filters, that kind of thing. Yes, but then also you have to prepare them. You know, have conversations, make sure you have relationships where they feel like they could come and talk to you. Talk to them about your own experiences with this stuff. Talk to them about what they're seeing with their friends and at school. You have to prepare them because like nothing you do is going to stop them from being thrown into this difficult world. So I say, focus on those two things and then join me and help me change the world so that it doesn't have to be so bad that they're that they're living in. So that these companies have a more responsible you know, way forward. So protect them and prepare them and then join me in trying to change it. Well, that's the perfect segue. How can people join you? How can they figure out, find out, research, discover more about your organization? Mm -hmm. And if they want to, support you guys. Thank you. Well, I think the dirty dozen list is what people just love. And we've made it possible for you to email the executives of all these companies. <laughs> like, so easy. The companies hate us. That's They're savage like, and awesome. I know. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm, not, I'm not above shaving them or going directly for them. You shouldn't be. And, and it works. It works. So please send an email, send emails to the executive of these companies at dirtydozenlist.com. And then just come learn. We have a lot of resources on our website. And of course, we need financial support whenever that's possible to give um, at insexualexploitation.org. So. Dawn, I'm going to let you close it out. Be respectful of your time. What would you like to leave people with? Well, you know, the world, it's terrible, but there's so much hope. I mean, I tried to share with you change is possible. And as we speak up, we, we're winning. It's just we need to join together and speak up louder. So if you're feeling discouraged, just know change is coming. It's happening. It's possible. So don't give up and join me. I hope you found today's episode to be eye-opening. And like I said in the intro, I hope that it lights a fire under your ass and that you can take action because of it. If you want to find out more about Dawn's work in the NCOSE, you can go to endsexualexploitation.org. I'm going to add to that, let's not forget the Dirty Dozen list. I think it's incredibly powerful when individuals and organizations receive a united front of people demanding that they take or change action. 
Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an Ironclad original. We're going to be back next week with an all-new episode. Have a good one.